I cried at my mother's funeral. I played the game. And I won. These three phrases are so different. I used to work as a copywriter, so in many ways I'm more interested in the effect a statement has than its literal meaning or even its truth. That first statement, I cried at my mother's funeral. It's not exactly a scientific statement unless you clearly defined what you meant by crying, but it is one that lends itself to objective verification. Not like I played the game. What game? I mean, I was never a sportsman. Um, it, but it's a sort of rhetorical statement, you know. Someone at my um, memorial service would say, one thing you say about Lionel Sell, he sure played the game. Loud cheers. But when we come to, and I won, we really are into bullshit territory. I mean, when I compare myself with other people of my background and education, I really am one of life's losers. In fact, I remember once, I think it was Lockenhouse, late 80s, someone said to me, you know, Lionel, you're very wise for your age. What's your secret? And I said, oh, it's been my privilege to spend many years at the feet of the world's greatest teacher. Oh, who's that? I said, her name is Failure. That's an important example. I'm going to come back to that. But first, where did those um, phrases come from? Well, a book we did when I was at school was L'Étranger by Albert Camus which I read many years later in English translation um, as The Outsider, because it describes this guy, Merceau, who you could say was living totally in the moment. He was a sensualist. One thing I remember from that early reading was um, his pleasure at drying his hands on a freshly laundered towel. And I could identify with that, as I could with his love of sunbathing. But it wasn't just his outward senses he was so aware of. It was also, um, he had a sense of what was going on inside himself. And that actually was part of the problem because he was so honest about that. You see, at his mother's funeral, um, everyone else was sort of sobbing and showing regrets and everything. And he didn't actually feel that. He was quite sort of, aloof. Um, and Camus writing an afterward afterwards said, you know, the moral of my story is rather paradoxical, which is a man who doesn't cry at his mother's funeral will be sentenced to death. And sure enough, towards the end of the book, he um, is in a court of law on a murder charge. And uh, his defence lawyer says, look, uh, the evidence is strong against you, but you do have mitigating circumstances. And the best thing you can do is to show remorse, and the jury will probably let you off more lightly. But he said, I don't actually feel remorse. I mean, if anything, what I'm feeling is more like rage. And sure enough, he um, was sentenced to death. Now, if his, um, uh, Camus says, the trouble with Merceau is he refused to play the game. What okay. game? You see, if you went to those jurors and said, I regret to say that my um, client is uh, unable to play your game, they would say, what do you mean? This is the game? This is dead serious. As far as they're concerned, you know, they were doing purely what is right and proper. But from Merceau's rather detached viewpoint, he could see these sort of conventions as games that people choose to play. Um, now, this, this games playing thing um, was very, made it very interesting to my generation. Um, you see, you know the way sort of one generation tends to sort of react against the previous generation? 
Well, the people who grew up before the Second World War, they were a pretty impassioned generation. You know, they sided either with the fascists or the communists, they went into the streets and marched, waved banners and got into fights, and got into being soldiers in the Second World War. Now, I know it's not fair to make these broad statements about generations, but if you know what to look for, you, you can see there's an element of truth in this. Well, the ones who were actually born during the war and afterwards um, couldn't help thinking when they come across most so if more people had uh, spent their time sunbathing and drying their hands on clean towels instead of getting so head up about things, World War II might not have happened. Millions of lives might have been solved. Um, now that is an attractive idea. But it's all more attractive because it's very shocking to the previous generation who was very committed. Um, and that gave Merceau a sort of attraction. You know, he was cool. Um, and in fact, uh, during the 50s, um, it was rather fashionable to become an existentialist and to wear the right clothes, smoke the right cigarettes, be in the right cafes and read Sartre and so on and so forth. So much so that not playing the game became the new game. And that is how my generation tended to see it. Because we were the hippie generation the next round long. And um, we were very much into playing games. One of the most popular books at my school um, uh, with a series by Stephen Potter uh, called Gamesmanship, Lifemanship, One-Upmanship. And they were very funny books, um, making fun of the sort of games people play and introducing meta-games. Uh, there are so many examples. That, um, I'll just give give one. You know, uh, when you're the young, newly married uh, graduate, what could be more of a losing situation um, than to be visited by one of your gay bachelor friends? You know, they are sort of up to your knees in toys in a tiny little flat that you can ill afford with screaming children, wet nappies sleepless nights and uh, a wife who's getting very much irritated like you are and then up breezes this person in his red sports car with the latest glamorous blonde by his side and says i say old chap how's married life treating you a downer well what stephen potter says is don't worry you've got the ultimate weapon in your hand you just say to him would you mind holding the baby and instantly he's a sort of frozen, terrified person looking an absolute prat in front of his girlfriend, and so on. You know, the meta game that puts you up on top. Well, of course, although I didn't think of it at the time, of course, when I said, um, uh, you know, my privilege of sitting at the feet of the world's greatest teacher, in a way, I was still playing that game. I was suggesting, you know, the game of life, you can be a winner or a loser, but there's a meta game becoming why. You know? And I won. Um, yeah, we were very much into games, my generation. And in a way, you know, the hippie thing was a very game-playing time. Um, uh, you know, they're the soldiers, all the um, riot police lined up with their guns, you know, and um, what do you do? Do you play their game and start throwing stones, that sort of thing? No, what the hippies did is we went up and you know, they put, handed them a flower and blew them a kiss and they, they blew their minds because it was a meta game they just weren't prepared for. And, um, you know, a sort of typical open air rock festival would have, you know, the psychedelic bands would have Jimi Hendrix and all that, but would also have Tiny Tim on his ukulele. And everyone came and went wild, yeah, cool, far out, man, you know. And, uh, you know, they realised any music was enjoyable. You just have to get into the right game and you can enjoy it. And this sort of game-playing thing actually had quite had mileage because um, going forward to ten years later, the late 70s, I remember the first time I heard the word yuppie. And it was in a radio discussion programme 
and the um, one of the speakers mentioned the word yuppie and people said sorry what's that and he said oh we haven't heard of a yuppie a yuppie is a person who plays the finance game but doesn't buy it now what was interesting about that of course is only a few years later that word yuppie became synonymous with people who totally bought the finance game they were so much into it that there was no reality other than finance and there's a a danger there you see that um, game playing can be so absorbing so fascinating that it becomes the real thing it ceases to be a game and um, of course uh, yeah there's a warning there now going back to my school days one of the games we played was Ouija uh, you know where you make a circle of letters and you put a, um, put a, um, a glass in the middle and you put your fingers on it and you turn down the lights and start asking questions and the thing begins to move and it spells out answers and you get a load of rubbish but amongst it there can be some quite interesting and remarkable insights can turn up now that was the game we played i remember someone with a meta game who said you're being deceived that's rubbish um, the Bible says you shouldn't do things like that, and it is Satan making you think you're getting interesting answers that you're hearing from the spirits, but he's just leading you astray down the path of occultism, magic, and wickedness. Now, the reason I remember that, of course, was because the that was so rare, that sort of opinion, in the 1950s, a time of high skepticism. And a much more common response was, you're being fooled, you're being deceived, it's your brain. Um, it loves to see patterns and, and, and make patterns. And so it's making sense out of the nonsense you're getting. And that is making you suggestible and so, and so on and so forth. In both cases, they came in with the meta game, And they won because when you say you know the truth and um, you make it sound convincing, uh, you know, we were the losers. But looking back, what was happening there was that they were playing the Platonist game, if you like. What I mean is that this idea was put forward by Plato in the classical era, that uh, we are living in a subjective world of our senses, and that actually it's an illusion. And he gave this analogy, he said, we're like people in a cave who will be brought up watching these shadows moving on the back wall of the cave. And we take that to be reality. That's what our senses tell us. But if only we could turn around, look behind us, we would see the entrance to the cave, the light shining in, and the real objects that are casting their shadows. You see, um, this puts a sort of, adds a sort of truth layer to the world that we experience. Um, I use that term a bit like sort of communications theory, you know, the layer model, where, look, I'm talking to you, so my vocal cords are vibrating the air and sensors in your head are picking that up and converting it to what sounds like sounds. I call that the transport layer. But of course, um, you don't know yet whether I'm actually trying to communicate with you. you know, um, I might just be belching or muttering to myself or groaning or something. Um, there's a higher layer that you know that I am actually trying to get your attention. You know, uh, I'm not drowning, I'm waving. Um, call that the communication layer. But you still won't know what the hell I'm on about unless we have a shared language. You know, you can understand English, a language layer. And even then, I might be saying things where you know the words, but you just can't make head or tail of the rubbish I'm speaking. Uh, there has to be a sort of a meaning layer and so on. So you see, Plato, the Platonic idea was that behind this experience that our senses give us, there is a higher layer of truth. Now, that layer was 
became very powerful in the classical era because it built up on the idea of a rational universe. It began with the atomic theory that um, in the world matter is made up of indivisible atoms, which we now use the word atoms to mean things that can be divided and split, but we still uh, stick to the idea of fundamental particles or smallest units of existence or quanta. Um, so the idea of atomism and also of one-dimensional time that Heraclitus put forward in 500 BC, he was quoted as saying, no man can step into the same river twice. The idea being that the next time you step in, the atoms of water would be different or in a different mix. And the human himself um, will have had the experience of the past and therefore be a different person. So time was one dimensional. And so as everything was interactions between atoms, everything was a chain of cause and effect, a rational one where you could in theory explain everything at this truth layer. So that's a very powerful idea. And um, it uh, you know, dominated thinking for 500 years um, before the birth of Christ. Now, in those terms, you could say my generation, the hippie generation, what we were doing was adding above the platonic layer a games layer, basically saying, you know, choose your game and play it, call it truth, do what you like with it, sort of thing. Um, and uh, it was fun. Yeah, you know, um, use tarot one day, <laughs> astrology the next day, um, combine it with the E-King the next day, you know, do the whole lot together. Just choose what game you want to play and, and if it works, do it, you know, nice. Um, but this was pretty upsetting to people who had um, a strong um, commitment to a particular truth. Uh, and, you know, maybe generation was accused of being spoilt <laughs> generation, <laughs> um, indulgent, you know, too much money. Um, uh, they hadn't had to fight a war like we have and that sort of thing. Um, and in particular, people began to ask the question, which gathered momentum towards the end of the century, is whatever happened to the Enlightenment? I mean, you know, we've had 500 years of um, reviving this rationalist um, way of thinking, classical thinking, um, scientific education, you know, a rational universe, things making sense. What's happened to these people? Suddenly going back to all this mumbo jumbo and new age crap and that sort of thing. Um, now, they were upset by that, um, but they still could play their meta game and explain it in their own terms of, you know, Oh, when things are a bit uncertain, you know, people fall back on primitive ways of thinking. It gives them comfort, you know. Um, what was uncertain? Well, you know, the Cold War, you know, the threat of destruction or something. Well, as far as I'm concerned, um, for all that, it was probably a time of much greater certainty than we've lived through for centuries. But that was their, um, their meta game. Put it, keep putting us in our place. Um, now, I was towards the end of the century. I thought I, you know, I could perhaps could help answer that question. Whatever happened to the Enlightenment? Several people were quoting that in um, articles they wrote, because you see, um, I was someone who was brought up in this very rational 1950s, and so I thought I could write a a book and explain some of this um, from my own experience. Uh, because I didn't see it as a slipping back. If anything, I saw it as a natural progression forwards. Because, you see, Plato's disciple, Aristotle, came up with a new angle on things. Now, this is important. He didn't say Plato was wrong. There is no truth. What he said was that, look, 
if we've been given these senses and we've been born into this um, world where we look at the back of a cave, not that sort of thing, surely human knowledge ought to begin by addressing this subjective experience and what we actually see and feel and touch and everything. Um, and rather than sort of speculating about you know, what might exist up there, you see, it's as though we were fish in a lake. And it's all very well going on about, you know, oh, there's a much bigger world of air up there, you know, faster than our lake. We're fish, for heaven's sake, you know. Ought we to get to know the medium we're in before we start um, spending too much time in this speculation? So he set the idea of observing nature as it is, in its fullness. And his contribution to later science was that he was a very good observer, very accurate. Um, you could say the downside of that is that his theories were therefore not as neat and clean as the Platonic theories. Um, for instance, their idea of a heliocentric universe, which worked very nicely, for when you're actually in subjective seeing things as they are, he returned us to the geocentric model and it dominated things for centuries. So you could say that was a backward step. But the thing is, um, it caught on. Uh, to some extent, people get tired of hearing all these experts going on about the real world out there. Um, take the example of a man who falls madly in love with a neighbor's wife. What an amazing experience that could be, you know, the, the thrills and the downs and the miseries and so on and so forth. Um, now, to have some person saying, Oh, um, you know, the truth is that you're being tempted by Satan um, to, into sin, you know, I think. Um, or uh, it's your genes wanting to reproduce themselves that's making that happen. Or um, uh, what you're really doing is projecting your anima into her, you know, it's a delusion. Um, or else. Um, it's your hormones, you know, and I can give you tablets to reduce that effect if you like, you know, and then you won't have to suffer. All those explanations are sort of interesting and they have some value, yes, yes. But do they really compare to the point of trashing the amazing experience you're having? I mean, if you go into the arts culture, you might write a great poem, make a a novel about it, a movie, write music. There's so much you could do with that. Um, uh, you could make great art, use that inspiration. Or if you go into the magical culture, um, you know, a chaos magician might use that energy to charge a sigil, or um, a pagan might gain a wonderful goddess contact um, through that experience, or a new Asia might find they're in a feminine or whatever, you know. Um, there's such potential in that subjective experience that these explanations, for all their value, can seem awfully trite compared to that. A good reading, you know, a clairvoyant reading or a tarot reading, if you know how to use it, has got the potential to change your life. And is that really worth so much less than the knowledge, oh, it might be a clear, um, you know, cold reading, or you might be deceiving or so forth. This sort of bottom-up shift from, um, you know, turning your back on the experts and um, saying, well, let's go with what we actually experience. Um, you know, if, if I'm feeling bad and I take homeopathic remedies, I feel better. Well, why can't I say I've been cured by them, you know? Um, it's got an attraction, it's got momentum. Um, so that's what happened, you know, after five centuries of uh, the classical era and the rational universe, we moved into the Roman era, when um, everything that we now associate with the um, magical rival came into being. Uh, Greek medicine, for instance, 
was so 20th century in the sense that um, they said the doctor shouldn't speak to the patient. No, no, that brings in subjectivity. Uh, what you should do is study the symptoms and the things that cure those symptoms and prescribe accordingly. When in the Roman era, you've got Galen, and um, uh, people who felt ill would go to a healing place and they would be encouraged to have dreams about their condition. They would um, be given a complete regimen of diet and exercise, and they would even act out their symptoms you know, in psychodrama and, and things like that. Yeah. I mean, it really was holistic healing that came back in alternative remedies. And um, as I say, that, uh, that geocentric view of the planets, um, which um, Aristotle um, encouraged led to the birth of astrology as we now know it and um, uh, and um, the chemical I mean the very uh, sort of technical chemical metallurg metallurgical experiments have been done um, in classical era when you add to that your full subjective reaction to it you know how you're feeling as you're doing it it grew into alchemy and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and you know, Roman uh, temples were very much magical places where you went to invoke the right god to get the right thing to happen. So, um, playing the game uh, took over from this search for truth. Uh, what feels good, what um, works in your everyday subjective life, you know. Uh, not saying there wasn't a truth, but just, you know, maybe what works is more important than um, worrying about what might actually be true. And so this was what happened to the, you know, this is the gullible masses, if you like, um, and I saw that same progress happening again. Now, if that's all there was to it, it would be bad enough for the people who said whatever happened to the Enlightenment. But they had a double whammy, actually, because there was also a top-down pressure. People were playing a metagame above them. And this, I think, was even much more upsetting. And I've read, you know, even recently, rants against those sort of postmodern philosophers who started to question the reality of scientific discovery and suggesting that um, you know the truth is actually a social construct and things like that. Now I think this top-down pressure also has a relevance <coughs> but remember what I said that um, the magical game-playing thing is not saying that there is no truth it is simply saying that maybe um, truth is not the ultimate criterion. You see, in the religious times, you could say that righteousness was the ultimate criterion. You know, if, if you were a preacher, you might be going through a dark night of the soul and actually a crisis of faith, but you still know it is right to preach the word of the Lord. Um, that is what you should do while you struggle with your own problems. So in other words, righteousness was the thing. And um, to merely tell the truth might have seemed rather shocking. Um, but um, to admit the truth, we say. Uh, but in the same way, you know, the idea of um, truth, which feels right, can be rather shocking to people like me, because I was brought up um, in the 50s and almost equate truth with righteousness. And I always find it very difficult to do the thing of, you know, there's someone on their deathbed looking absolutely awful, and you say to them, oh, you're looking much better today. You know, I never was very good at that. Or, um, as my wife would tell you, um, I really struggle to say, oh, your new hairstyle looks wonderful, when I don't think it does. Uh, I'm not very good at that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I suffer from a bit of an addiction to truth. But I can value um, uh, those who put effectiveness and... Uh, what feels right at the moment. I can see the value in that. Uh, yes, yeah, so anyway, um, 
this pressure from above, you see, has had its a similar thing happening um, back in the classical era, because I mentioned this rational universe, you know, made of atoms and chains of cause and effect. Well, the mathematicians put a bit of a spanner in the works when they said, how many atoms are there? How small are these indivisible atoms? Let us say there are one zillion to the inch. So if you make a square one inch by one inch, there'll be a zillion atoms by a zillion atoms. And how many go along the diagonal? And you can very easily prove that you can't make that diagonal out of atoms. Um, however many you put in, there'll still be a bit left over. And even if you make the atoms smaller, there will always be a bit left over. They had to face the horror for their rational universe that the diagonal of that square would be irrational. Um, it just couldn't exist in terms of atoms. And this was a shock to their philosophy. And it would be bad enough if they had to add to their nice mechanical universe a few drops of irrationality to make the cogs work okay, you know, like oil. But it was worse than that because the rational numbers are infinite, but they're countably infinite, whereas the irrational numbers are uncountably infinite. So rather than just, you know, a few drops of oil on the cogs to make it work, they face a situation that the entire rational universe was like a speck of dirt floating on the surface of a vast ocean of irrationality. And uh, classical philosophy began to creak and crack a bit. And this was the pressure from above, if you like. And I know you can't put too much on the words of the Bible because they're translations. But it is very telling that when um, Pontius Pilate um, was judging Christ, he's quoted as saying, what is truth? Not what is the truth, which you might expect a judge to say, but what is truth? And a similar crisis um, uh, happened 2,000 years ago. Now, as I say, this is rather threatening because, um, for instance, um, you know, in Dawkins' series of, uh, you know, the enemies of, enemies of reason, I think it's called, um, I think talking to Darren Brown, they suggest that uh, the postmodern philosophers really got something to answer for, for this nonsense about saying, you know, there is no truth, which of course is a paradoxical thing to say because it's just a new truth. Um, and there have been a lot of sort of angry articles about people like Alan Sokal and that sort of furiously, um, really angrily acting against this um, post, uh, this you know, postmodern ideas. And I'm not really um, into that debate. I'm just speaking for magical thinking and why I think it's there and everything. But um, I do see a sort of parallel with what happened before. Because after all, um, when, I was at when I was at school, uh, we did maths, maths and physics. And the physics, uh, the maths masters were a bit scornful about us having to do physics too when we were meant to be mathematicians. <laughs> they called it the folklore department. And I didn't really see what they were getting at until many years later. It's only recently it occurred to me that you see, when, um, I remember the lesson when a master came in and wrote that I be such that I squared equals minus one. And he had a rebellion on his hand. Because of our physics education, we say, but it doesn't exist. You know, there is no square root of minus one. It's not real, it's rubbish. Um, you know, person said, well, think of it as another dimension. What, what which dimension, you know, where is it? Point. Um, he had a rebellion on his hand for half the lesson before we would settle down and be prepared to actually work with what he called imaginary numbers. And we found that they worked in the sense that you know, it was a valid 
number system. Um, and uh, then, of course, the interesting thing is, is they actually turn out to be rather effective. You know, the basis of, of most modern physics is actually based on um, these imaginary numbers. You see, our face-to-face -face similar um, thread when um, I suggested, uh, I think it's in the book, of, yeah, in my book, How to See Fairies, I said, you know, a pretty good way of doing gardening is to ask the fairies and ask the plants where they should be planted. Um, and some people said, but that's rubbish, they don't exist, you know, they're, they're not real. And I said, try it, play the game, you know, take your plant and ask it where it wants to go. See if you communicate with it. And I won't say it's better than getting an expert gardening book, but it works pretty well. And some people, like the Findhorn people, got such good results and blew the minds of other gardeners. Um, you see, just as the Greeks had to admit um, irrationality into a rational universe, um, the physicists had to admit imaginary numbers into their real world. These things um, have a way of sort of, uh, you know, when the wall, the mode of the music changes, the walls of the city shake. These things do have a, a, a top-down effect, which is slightly disturbing. Um, but, you know, as I say, I understand some of that regret because of, there was an article in The Economist recently called Post-Truth Politics. And it was saying, you know, the sort of, how Putin and uh, Brexit people and Trump are now prepared just to s tell straight lies. Um, they don't even sort of justify them with arguments. Um, you could, I don't know, say Obama is a, a Muslim or something. You just say that for its effectiveness and for the feelings it evokes, you know, forget the truth. And I can see that is, that is unpleasant. Um, and I compare it with, you know, Dawkins and his attack on people who convince gullible people that they have psychic powers in order to get money out of them. Now, uh, I would not be right behind Dawkins if he'd stuck to an attack on confidence tricksters. Because these people who are doing that are confidence tricksters, plain and simple. It isn't really, you shouldn't attack the psychic people, you know, the tarot readers and that. Many of them don't ask for money for um, the, the, you know, the spiritualists and that, and spiritualist churches. Um, they're doing something sincerely and offering something which other people find of value. I, my intro is full of um, spam mail trying to get money out of me. But... Most of it actually quotes scientific things. You know, there's an algorithm that will make a fortune in spread betting, or um, the latest herbal remedy, and here are the scientific reports, you know, that, um, that uh, would say how brilliant it is, that sort of thing. Um, uh, it is also true that, you know, science has been used to kill people and to um, do things that ruin the environment. That doesn't mean that I want to sort of launch a campaign of, you know, science, the enemy of the people. I rather say, no, we should have better education, scientific education, in order to um, stop this sort of thing happening and being abused. Well, really, that's my attitude towards magical thinking. I think it is something which is happening. Um, it, we're moving into the era of magical thinking. And um, I can see it is very uh, threatening to some people, but, uh, and it is having some negative consequences. But I think the answer is really to understand better what is happening, to have a better education into magical thinking, um, so that we can do it properly rather than denying it. People deny it. You know, there are even astrologers who would be happier to be called scientists than to be associated with magic. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've experienced um, magical thinking even in Dawkins. Um, so, uh, the book I've written, 
my years of magical thinking is an attempt to explain how my thinking developed and how it took me from an Enlightenment rationalist education to an interest in magic and even writing books about it. And um, I think my disappointment in completing the book is realising that when I thought I was doing something for those people when I answered the question, what happened to the Enlightenment in giving my side of it, they weren't actually wanting an answer. I think in many cases it was a cry for help. They were saying, we don't like this trend. Who else doesn't like it? Let's try to get together and stop it from happening. And I don't think they've succeeded. 